Hello, my name is Bishop Daniel Muggenberg, and I would like to reflect with you on the gospel passage you will hear when you come to church this Sunday and we celebrate the 15th Sunday in Ordinary Time. Our gospel will come from Mark chapter 6, and in this passage we read of Jesus sending the 12 disciples on mission. Now, one of the first things that should surprise us about our Lord sending the 12 on mission is that they really have been with him for a very short period of time. Uh, the Gospel of Mark, as it's related, maybe um, indicates that the disciples had been accompanying Jesus for a few weeks. So they really had heard some of his teaching. They had seen him perform miracles. They had watched his interaction with people. But they were in no way, shape, or form fully prepared and credentialed to be great missionaries in the world. And yet that's part of the message. You see, sometimes we think that we can't be on mission or we can't take on a particular ministry until we have completely finished extensive programs of formation and we have our degree of readiness. Well, the reality is different from that. Jesus wanted his disciples to begin sharing with others what they themselves had received as soon as possible. And so rather than waiting until they spent three years with him and they were fully commissioned and blessed, our Lord is sending them on mission as one of their very first experiences. Jesus is telling them, you've now heard some of my parables, you have seen my healing, so now you go on mission. Tell others what you've heard. Tell others what you've seen. You know, it's really a beautiful thing to see people so ready to share their faith that even though they themselves are, are still young disciples, they're still eager to share the experience of Jesus that they themselves have had. Maybe they don't have the language, maybe they don't have all the education, and they don't have the teaching skills, but what they do have is the experience with Jesus, and they're ready to share that with others. And so Jesus is sending the disciples on this mission because he wants them to know from the very beginning that it is essential for every disciple to be a missionary. It's not something that we do that during the second part of our lives, but essential to discipleship is being a missionary. And so that's why Jesus sends them on mission very early in the gospel narrative. <clears throat> now, whenever we are told that um, he's preparing them for their journey, the word for journey in Greek is actually the word way, W-A-Y, way. And that's an important word because when we look at the um, book of Acts, we are told that Christians were first <clears throat> called followers of the way because that, that's how they referred to themselves, because they were people who followed the way of Jesus. Only later in Antioch were they called Christians. So when Jesus sends his disciples on the way, it's important for us to see in that phrasing that Jesus is sending them on the Christian way um, and following him in how they now interact with others and the message that they bring to communities. And Jesus tells them some very important instructions that we should pay attention to. The first is, he says, to bring a walking stick. Now, the walking stick wasn't just for support, you know, and assistance in physically walking, but the walking stick also served for protection against wild animals or other things like that. In the Old Testament, a walking stick also had another purpose. It was a symbol of Moses' power and his authority. So by sending his disciples with a walking stick, Jesus may have been very well telling them, you know, yes, take the necessary preparation so that you have the support and the protection you need, and also go with a sense of authority because you are, <coughs> excuse me, in fact, leading people on a new exodus 
just as Moses did in the Old Testament. Next, Jesus tells them to <clears throat> carry no bread um, and no uh, beggar's bag, no money in their belt, etc. Now, in telling them to carry no bread and no money in their beggar's bag, no beggar's bag, one, Jesus is wanting them to rely on divine providence and to understand that the Lord will provide for their needs if they truly do trust God. But secondly, Jesus does not want them to be understood as people who make money from their ministry. You know, it, it was common in the time of Jesus for miracle workers or for philosophers to charge for their services. Jesus never wanted his disciples to do that. In fact, he will tell his disciples that you have received without cost, and so you are to give without cost. The, the ministry of the gospel is, is given by grace, and we share it freely by grace with others. So Jesus did not want his, di his disciples to be seen as people who were seeking personal gain from the ministry entrusted to them. Next, they are told to not wear two tunics or to not bring two tunics. <clears throat> now, that may strike us as odd, like who would go on a journey without an extra pair of clothes? We have to remember, though, that in the ancient world, clothing was a symbol for a person's identity. And if we understand it that way, then we understand why Jesus said, don't bring two tunics. Namely, don't be one person when you are proclaiming the gospel and then be another person uh, that evening because people lose integrity and people lose credibility when they lose consistency of character. Think, for instance, of someone who, you know, may be very pious when they come to church, but they can be ruthless and unethical in the office. Or someone who may put on a kind and loving face when they're at a church ministry event, but they can be mean to others when they're at home or wherever else. When we see people who are two-faced, we instinctively lose respect for them and we lose, they lose credibility. That's why integrity and consistency of character is an essential quality for a disciple in order for them to be an effective missionary and evangelizer of others. So Jesus tells the disciples, <clears throat> do not bring two tunics. And what he's saying is, be the same person. Be the same person when you're telling people about me and when you're sharing dinner with them. And be that same person if you're playing sports with them or if you're working in the office with them. Be that same person of consistent character. Be a person of integrity. Jesus tells them if they were to wear sandals, and that not only has a practical you know, benefit, namely to protect your feet, but we need to remember that the Israelites in the Exodus uh, were described as wearing sandals. And so in a real sense, Jesus may be saying to his disciples that they are leading people on a new exodus into a new reality, the kingdom of God, and a new promised land, the kingdom of heaven. And so just as the Israelites were walking away from um, Egypt, which was a place of slavery, um, into a place of freedom, so the disciples on mission are now leading the people they encounter from their slavery, a slavery caused by ignorance and sin, into a newfound freedom, which is the gospel and Jesus Christ. And so all of these symbols become very effective statements um, and I think very much help us stay focused in our ministry today um, as a church. And one of the last things that Jesus does for his disciples is he prepares them for moments of failure. Now that's important because the disciples um, might be surprised if their gospel message is rejected or when their gospel message is rejected. 
Jesus doesn't want them to be surprised by those moments. He wants them to be prepared for those moments and to handle them accordingly. So he tells them that, you know, when a town doesn't receive you, shake the dust from your feet. He tells them what to do and then to move on. Because rather than sticking around and becoming um, angry or, uh, you know, becoming stubborn, um, move on. If people are not willing to listen to you, go find people who will listen to you. But one thing is for sure that, you know, people can't listen to you unless you're speaking to them. So rather than um, continuing to just spin your wheels and lose endless amounts of time and frustration in one place, continue to preach the gospel and go to where it will be received <clears throat> rather than just becoming frustrated where it is not received. Now, that's an important message for us because sometimes it's a lot more difficult for us to complain about how people are not responding to the gospel than it is to go out and find the creative new areas and new audience where people will respond to the gospel. So that encourages us as the church to be persevering, yes, but also to be creative and to recognize where the gospel needs to be proclaimed in our world today so that it can be heard and people can respond to it. One thing is sure, and that is that no one will respond to it if they never hear it. And the main reason they will never hear it is because we fail to be effective witnesses of it. So this gospel passage is teaching us how to be credible witnesses, how to stay on mission, how to continue the ministry of Jesus, um, and especially how to uh, bring that healing gift of salvation to people's lives. So let us pray that uh, we will continue to be a people on mission, and we will continue to embody these same necessary qualities and characteristics that Jesus um, instructed his own disciples to have. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you continue to send us on mission every day. You want us to be credible and effective witnesses of you and the world. We pray that you will remind us daily of the characteristics we need to have so that others will be able to hear you speaking through us and encounter your love and mercy through our healing ministries, no matter what form they take. Healing of mind, healing of body, and healing of soul. Lord, may we be your salvific presence in the world, leading people to you and not to ourselves. We ask this in Christ's name, amen. May the blessing of Almighty God descend upon you and remain with you forever, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.